Hello. Welcome to, why are we talking about rabbits? Rabbits are things that go down rabbit holes. They're all over the internet. They jump around, reproduce quickly, oftentimes without any clear reason why. Why are we talking about them is not, we're going to talk about them, but why is everybody else talking about them? That's this podcast. Today, we just send you to Montana last month for a talk from our executive field worker at First Things Foundation, Daniel Paternos. He presents to a conference of Orthodox and Orthodox curious people about the nature of society. Today, he does it with a twist by talking about the nature of our work and why folks might be interested in doing it. This is a special edition of Watar. It's great to be here in Butte. Father Deacon, that was a perfect intro. We didn't even coordinate that, but it's perfect lead in, so thank you. I'm talking about First Things Foundation. If you guys have not heard of First Things, it was started by a guy named John Hears. John has a podcast that you may have heard of. It's called Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? Um, and so just to give you a little nutshell of what we do, we, it's sort of like Orthodox Peace Corps. Some people call it that, kind of. We send people for two years. They work in isolated communities around the world. The first year they spend uh, immersing, learning language, sort of getting down, uh, getting dirty. And, uh, and then the second year they spend using all the enculturation that they've experienced. And they find people, locals, and we help them develop their ideas, their projects. That's a nutshell. Um, but I thought, I thought for the sake of this conference, um, perhaps I should define first things apophatically, if you will, say what we're not. So plain and clear, first things is not the church. It's not you know, the inner sanctum. It's, it's not the mysteries. It's not the holy of holies. Uh, we sort of understand uh, first things to be maybe a limb or you know, extension, the thing that relies on the heart in the way that the heart pumps blood, it pushes life. Um, to the extremities of the body, so is first things. Uh, we we kind of like the analogy that we're sort of kind of dog-headed St. Christopher types walking around in the woods, enthralled with what's inside the castle, but just curious, and we love meeting people and sharing what, you know, what's inside the walls. So uh, to give a brief little history of first things, like I said, it was started by John Hears in 2016. He took our first field worker to Guatemala, and before that time, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali, West Africa, in the 90s. He then went to Georgia, Republic of Georgia, and Eastern Europe, uh, where he uh, was with IOCC, International Orthodox Christian Charities. And then he, he was an Orthodox missionary in Haiti with his family. And after 20 years of high school education, he then decided to start First Things with all those experiences. Um, and as for me, I joined First Things in 2017. I went to Sierra Leone, uh, also West Africa. For two years, I spent my first year with Bishop Themi there. He has a beautiful Orthodox mission in Freetown, that's the capital city. And then my second year, I moved out to a village called Kailaun to assist locals with ideas. So I'm gonna break this talk into four parts. Um, I'll start with uh, this idea called the KP, or a, a, a concrete event called the KP. Um, you might have heard of it, also known as a Supra. If you guys have been to Georgia, it's, uh, it's this fe uh, feasting tradition. Um, and then I'll talk about hospitality and how those tie together, and then creation, uh, immersion in creation. And so uh, hopefully this idea of the KP sort of weaves it all together. So a KP, also known as a Supra, it's a feasting tradition. If you guys have heard of Georgia, it's the country that was enlightened by St. Nino, equal to the apostles, fourth century, ancient, ancient stuff. Um, and so they started this tradition. It was actually, it predates Christianity, but the Christians baptized it after saying Nino. And basically what it is, is it's a big feast. It's a big table filled with food, with wine, people coming together and sharing toasts. And it's liturgical in structure. So the first toast is always to God and the mother of God, etc. cetera. Um, so the, uh, there's a sort of a shared mythos, a shared origin story that the Georgians have. That, that involves the KP. And so you ask any Georgian today, this is kind of like an oral, oral uh, tradition thing. They'll tell you how this works. So, so what they say is, back in the time when uh, God was dividing the land among the peoples, 
uh, he had them cast lots, as they did, I guess. And so the Armenians went and they cast lots and they got Armenia and the Ethiopians received Ethiopia, etc. And everyone got their land, except the Georgians. Uh, the Georgians didn't show up. Uh, they overslept or something. And so they woke up the next day and they go to God and they ask God, uh, well, why didn't we receive, receive any land? And he asks them where they were and they, and they look at each other and they say, well, we were having this, this capy. We were having this beautiful feast. And in fact, we made the first toast to you. And it was all glorifying your mother and all these saints and these heavenly things. And the mother of God is listening. And she comes over and she says, you know what? I want to give the Georgians my special plot of land. And so that's how the Georgians understand that they received their land. And if you've been, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It, it's no wonder why the mother of God had that. Um, and so what were, they, what were they doing? What was this KP? So to break it down, what happens is, and, and by the way, this is the metaphor that we use for our work with first things, so I'll, I'll bring it back around. Um, but what happens at a KP, which I hope you all experience someday, is you sit down, there's food, it's like overflowing with food. There's not courses in like Western style. They just overload the table. It's a, an abundant feast. And there's wine, and there's a, a guy at the head named Atamada. And Atamada proposes toasts. And it's liturgical, like I said. And so the first toast is always to the highest things. So right now, the toast would be probably on the subject of Pentecost. And uh, the Tamara will speak. Sometimes he'll just say a few words. Sometimes he'll go give like a 30-minute sermon. And then he'll make the next toast, usually to the Mother of God, and then to peace, and to the Patriarch of Georgia, and then to those who have gone before, those who have departed. They remember at the table. And then to life, and men, women, tradition, courage, all these beautiful things. What the Georgians say is that it's, a, it's actually an icon. It's an icon of the Last Supper, where the Tamara is an icon of Christ breaking bread and sharing community. So um, I think it's interesting to point out, and it's really relevant to what Father Deacon was saying, in terms of uh, the Christian life not being up here. After 1,700 years of a nation being Orthodox, it shouldn't it shouldn't just be contained within the church walls. Like when a, when a person is baptized, they start changing. Of course, it starts within, and then they start wearing different clothes, and they associate with different people, and they eat different foods. Um, but when you have a collection of people or a culture baptized, the culture starts changing. The architecture changes. Um, you know, the, the way that people rise and go to sleep and, and the way they associate the words they use and not least of which is the way they dine. And so I think it's just, it's cool for us to recognize as Americans, little baby infant Orthodox, these traditions that uh, folks like Georgians have. And I think that we have a lot to learn from it. Um, so what's actually happening in the KP in two seconds is it's a meeting of heaven and earth. It's, it's a bringing things below, raw ingredients, food, meats, cheeses, people, people coming from all these different places, and they're elevated by heaven coming down in the logos, in the toast that they give, in the prayers, in the songs, in the blessings. And of course, we know that at the intersection of heaven and earth, or meaning and material, is man. And so that's, the Georgians understand this, they understand the power of words, and they don't waste words, trust me. Um, and so, like I said, this is all sort of a metaphor that we use for our work. I, th I felt like I needed a preface with this, this tradition. Um, and why is that? I'll get to my next point, hospitality. Sorry, Maximus. Maximus, thank you. That's a Supra, KP. Um, so what's happening at a KP table is something like proper hospitality. And what is hospitality? I think it's something like taking the outsider and properly integrating it, him or her, whatever it may be. And so you have this table and you have all of these outsiders and maybe they're family, but maybe they live in different homes and they come together. And as an American, I've been to several of these in Georgia and I'm the outsider. And after time, after toasts, uh, you propose toasts on the themes and you're sort of grafted into this beautiful thing and you're elevated. And what happens with hospitality as we, don't, we know in orthodoxy is your personality is not eliminated. When you're baptized, God doesn't just suddenly snatch up your personality and your identity. Some parts, yes, they get, they get burned by the fire, but the parts that can be redeemed remain. And, and this is how we got to uh, do, do hospitality 
um, with our neighbors, but I'm going to tie this into how we do it overseas. Maximus. So I, I wanted to bring in a quote from uh, Blessed Father Cosmas of Gregorio. You might, you might recognize that name from the Apostle to Zaire. Um, he was in Zaire, modern-day Congo, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they say he baptized 15,000 Congolese. He was a spiritual son of St. Paisios, who sort of sent him out to, to go do missionary work. And I love his approach, and it's kind of contained in this. It's not necessary to inoculate the African's body with our own civilization, with all its attendant cancers. The African has his own very noteworthy civilization, his own social structure. The missionary must labor greatly to discover and Christianize it. I just think it's so beautiful because, I mean, this is, this is fractally how it's manifest internationally, maybe in missionary overseas work, but it happens at a table, at a KP table, and it, it ought to happen in our relationships. This idea of recognizing Christ within each person and actually bringing it forth. Um, so this is, this is what we try to do with first things. Um, but as we know, if you can understand hospitality as a virtue, every virtue is flanked by, by two vices on the, on the left and the right. And so you can understand, perhaps in the left hand of hospitality, to be indifference. Someone knocks on your door, and you just don't even let them in at all. Indifference on the left hand. But you could say on the right hand, you could go too extreme. You could, I don't know, someone knocks on your door, you welcome them in, and then you chain them to your couch and make them learn all your family traditions. <laughs> Something like that. But, but this, this extreme going between the left and the right, us with first things, we've seen it over and over again in the way that international aid and development works um, in our modern world. We see people going to isolated communities, not building relationships, not learning language at all, being indifferent, and then suddenly controlling and thinking that they have all the right solutions. Um, and the way I know this, it was really strange. So I worked in Sierra Leone, like I said, for two years. After my first year learning the language, uh, working with Bishop Themi, I started to tell people that I'm there to help people with their ideas. And these Africans in this remote village started coming to me and saying that they have ideas for climate action and gender equity and uh, abortion rights and the weirdest things like pollution. How are they thinking about pollution out in Kailan? And um, what I realized is that I'm not, I'm not the first white guy that they met. And by, when I say white, in, in, in first things, we say we are, we're, we're light people, we're enlightened people. And, and they've seen plenty of enlightened people, plenty of people with big checkbooks, with a great plan. And as long as the Africans can say the right words, or whoever may be overseas, as long as they can say the right words, they'll receive the funding. It's, it's kind of a gross grand inquisitor situation. Um, so we try to flip this. We try to flip this. We try to do hospitality right. Um, let's see. Slide, Maximus, thank you. So, so that brings me to um, the immersion. Like I said, when we send people overseas, there's two, there's two phases. There's the immersion phase, when you enter into the culture, um, and then there's the creation phase. And so in the immersion, what we always say is, uh, you're stripped, A, and then you're putting on a culture. And so to put on a culture, you can't hide behind the, uh, the barbed wire, garments of skin. You don't drive around in Land Rovers like many people do. We live in mud huts. We get the local parasites. We eat local food. We commune uh, with the local community as much as possible. And um, I really like this analogy. I heard this from a Georgian in a toast. This isn't, uh, you can take that as you wish. But you all probably know about the mandorla, the uh, sort of the almond shape within the, uh, I suppose you call it a halo behind Abbot Trifon? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, this sort of almond shape behind there. Um, this Georgian was explaining that Christ is symbolos. Where Christ is, this is where things converge. It's where meaning converges. It's where human beings converge and where they share. And, um, and so you can see He's in the center where it converges. And so whenever we train our field workers, we always tell them, you start here, and this is the community. And if you think that you have anything to offer this when you're over here, you're just joking to yourself because you're not going to fix the poor. The poor is a concept, it's not a person. It requires personal relationship. In, or in order to do so, especially overseas, it's a, it requires a massive sacrifice. It requires getting sick 
being frustrated because you can't speak your language. Um, and then adult, we, we talk about it in terms of like crossing the Red Sea. You're stripped, you know, you're stripped of these things that you're used to, the, cu the culture that you're used to, the YouTube videos that you watch all the time. Um, and, uh, and for me, what happened was I started to lose myself, or I thought I started to lose myself. I, I sort of lost my footing and I, I thought, I don't know who I am, and not in relation to my friends and the, the media that I consume, the food that I'm used to eating, my normal American schedule going to the supermarket. Who am I apart from these things? And so what happens is our field workers get broken down, um, always. Everyone thinks, when I joined, I was like, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. <laughs> it happens to everyone. You get broken down. And this is, this is what happens. So we talk about the fruit that come of uh, our work. There's multiple fruit, but the first is the field worker. Um, no one fish, finishes two years of service like this, the same person, it would be, it would be crazy. And so there's this transformation that happens. And hopefully us as administrators and first things and with you know, spiritual fathers around us, we can offer our field workers who commit to this sacrifice the resources to get out of it. That's our goal. Um, and so let's go to, uh, let's go to the next. Oh, I missed this. I like this quote from St. Paisios. Uh, someone was asking him, this is in spiritual councils, one with pain and love for contemporary man. Year into nowadays, telecommunications are so advanced that one can see live what is happening on the other side of the earth. And he replies, yes, they can see the entire world, but they don't see themselves. That is the only thing they cannot see. It's, it's like, um, for me, it was a mirror. It was like, gosh, I did not realize I was this ugly. <laughs> but God wants us to see ourselves slowly. He does it gracefully. Um, but there's no way to transform unless you can see uh, your own wounds and scars. So this leads me to my next point, which is creation. Um, because there's not, sacrifice isn't empty. It's not, it doesn't just, you sacrifice and you wither away and you die. There's something that's born from that. It's a spiritual principle. Um, and just this morning, I, I, it rang in my ear. We kept uh, praying over and over again. You know, she who without corruption gave us birth to God the word. It's the purity. It's the renunciation of all earthly things. It's uh, putting aside worldly pleasures that actually opens up the space. For the mother of God, she was the perfect receptacle to bring the creator of, of the world into the world. So this is what we understand. So the field worker is transformed and created anew, but also we have these projects. So the first phase was the immersion and then the creation. During the creation phase, we start assisting local people. So unlike you know all these organizations that are working in offices in Belgium or wherever they are and they think they know exactly what these community need, communities need, um, where we try to be as patient as possible and we try to listen as much as possible. And we, we ended up identifying folks with ideas for sometimes their businesses, sometimes their community projects, but these are people in the community that are sort of trusted by the community that we gain their trust and so we have this process of sitting down with them, sharing meals, and bringing them from one point to the next. So um, I should give an example, I think, of a project. So when I, so I, lived, I lived in Freetown, Sierra Leone, for the first year, and then I, lived, I moved to Kailaun, and uh, I started looking for these impresarios. And the first one that came, I, I woke up one day to the normal West African wake-up call, um, the motorcycle engine revving at five in the morning. I walk out my house, and... Uh, and there was this giant bundle of bees. I like, had never seen bees like this before. It was like a tree branch and like billions of bees hanging down. It's like, that's crazy. Maybe they're, maybe they're building a beehive or something. And I thought maybe I could get some honey out of this. So I thought, and I went to, there's a, there a um, ministry of agriculture in Kailan. And so I went to the ministry and I asked if I could get a beehive or if they could help me. And they said, no because you live in the town and you know, if you're in the town, there's bees, people are gonna get stung. Um, but we got to talking and they told me about all these beehives that they'd put up in these uh, communities around Kailan where we were living. And they uh, ended up bringing me out to one of these villages uh, called Bobu, we went out to Bobu and uh, we met the villagers there who until then had just been relying on cassava farming and then they'd receive these beehives. 
um, just like one or two and it wasn't a big deal, but they were really excited about it. You know, they were like pumping the smoke in and I don't know exactly how it works, but I was, I was watching it happen and then we go back. And so after, you know, weeks of meals and hanging out with Alex and Fatorma, these two guys, uh, they started telling me that they wanted to spread their idea to other villages and actually export their honey. And so we, uh, we went to a few villages, asked the people if they were interested in, in, in doing something like this. And then me and my site partner started researching grants because of grants for this kind of stuff. And so um, we found a grant and, and uh, us with Alex and Fatorma, we, we wrote the grant and received $3,000. And then now they have this honey processing building that's over there that doubles as a cinema for some reason. That's how that works. Uh, and then, uh, and so now they're processing honey, they're labeling it and they're shipping it to uh, Freetown, the main city. Um, simple project, but that, like I said, you can't just think that thing up on your wonderful UN 2023 business goal plan. Um, and so these, uh, these projects, they're another fruit and I could, you know, we have all sorts of projects right now. We, we have, we have field workers in Guatemala, in uh, Sierra Leone, of course, Mozambique, we're sending uh, volunteers there, Republic of Georgia, and even in Appalachia. So um, we have all sorts of projects uh, happening right now. We had re just recently an Orthodox guy in Georgia funded a project for a well in Sierra Leone. Some, there was a village outside where we were living and everyone's getting sick and they came to us and they said we could release a well. And so they got a well and there's, um, you know, people got laid off in, in Guatemala and they wanted to start a sewing business and so we helped them buy some machines to start a little stowing business. There's, um, in Appalachia, there's a, there's a school for women who have been in abusive relationships or have been, you know, uh, on drugs or whatever it may be. Uh, and so we've helped them uh, develop their program to help these women sort of uh, gain basic life skills. Just a couple of uh, examples of projects. Um, so, uh, yeah. So immersion, creation, and these are tied into the KP, like I said, and you might be wondering how the heck does that work? Um, so at the KP table, like I said, if you remember, you have raw people, ingredients coming together um, from the outside into the inside, and they're transformed through the, through the, through the, um, through the words coming down, but also through the preface. When people sit down at this table, they sit down in love and they sit down in proper hospitality um, and communion. And uh, the things below that come together, they're elevated. And we understand that our field workers, it's similar. They go and you might see someone from the outside and think that guy just has sunburn and blisters on his hand from holding machete and um, he's getting sick. But, uh, but there's transformation happening because the work that they go to do is predicated on sacrifice and it's predicated on building personal relationships with these communities. Um, and as Father Deacon said, um, these, these things, these mysteries that everyone here holds so dearly within you know, the Holy Temple, they ought to emanate out. They ought to be manifest in the world. And, and when we are baptized, the world around us starts slowly kind of changing and it's transformed. And so um, this is what we've seen with the KP. It's what we're hopefully trying to do with First Things. And I just want to give one example of another way that we're trying to do this in Greenville, South Carolina. That's where I'm from. Um, we just started a restaurant two, two months ago. We opened and it's called KP, uh, believe it or not. And we, we serve Georgian food and we bring people together. And it's like our First Things headquarters. So all of our field workers come and they get trained there. And, um, and we have KPs every Friday. We have community KPs. And so people come, Orthodox people, of course, but also secular people or whatever. People show up and they sit down and then they hear toasts. They hear toasts to God and the mother of God and saints. And they hear about the meaning of an icon. And people love this thing. They're signing up like crazy. Um, we had a guy, um, a food blogger, Foodie McFooderson, kind of hilarious. But he came and... Uh, and he showed up and I think he had a few glasses of wine and went home and immediately wrote this blog about his experience. And it's a simple quote, but I liked it. I truly believe that if we as Americans had these kinds of traditions and dinners with each other, our country would be such a different place. So Father Deacon mentioned evangelization. I think even if, like when I hear the word evangelization, I get like cringy kind of, because 
I think we conflate it with hospitality done wrong. We conflate it with control mechanisms. And at the end of the day, a lot of evangelization today doesn't look that different from you know, UN goals being spread around the globe. Um, but what we're at least trying to do in Greenville is evangelization by doing hospitality properly. And people, you know, people are brought into the faith this way. It's how I was brought into the faith, through human beings, not through concepts. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So I'll, I'll wrap it up with how you can get involved. Um, we're hiring. We're always looking for field workers. Right now, in particular, we're looking to send people to uh, Georgia and Sierra Leone and Mozambique. Mozambique is a brand new site that we hope to send to strong people too by 2023. Um, you can also visit us in Greenville. You can come to a restaurant. We'd love to host you, sit you down at a KP. In fact, if you guys want to learn how to do one of these dinners, come find me. I'm happy to explain how it works. Um, I just came from LA, met this new church community. We had two KPs and they absolutely loved it. Um, and of course, you can also get involved as a donor. Our goal by 2023 is to have 10 churches giving just $100 a month. So we're trying to up that. So if that's something that you think you guys could do, a sacrifice that you could make, come talk to me. Um, and finally, I thought uh, I could end with a toast, although I don't have wine. I'm used to having wine with a toast. Um, but I'll make a toast to hospitality, because here at this conference, we have people coming from all over. Um, I don't know if anyone's international, but certainly all over the States. And we're all raw, you know, raw ingredients coming together. And so may we meet one another with charity. May we listen with open hearts and lay aside some of our ideas and be open to um, new ideas. And, uh, and may the things that we learn not die because if they remain in your head when you go home and nothing happens in your heart, then the idea dies. And so may, uh, as, the, as the heart pushes blood out, may we go out to our respective communities and create because that's what God created us to do to bring beauty into the world and to create so we say Gagi Marjos that's to you the victory in Georgian Gagi Marjos well there's Daniel that dude like how beautiful was that it's crazy so that's just a way to give you guys a little depth and breadth as to what we're doing. It's also a wonderful conversation using history, philosophy, theology, to try to understand this notion of service, old world and new. It's also an excellent explanation of why anyone would want to help people in this way. Look, there are a million ways to help people. People in first things, no judgment, man. Do what you got to do. This is a particular way with a particular telos in order to accomplish a certain thing in the souls of those who serve and, of course, in the lives of those with whom we work. So thanks to Daniel, thanks to folks who invited us to talk out there at Montanica, thanks to Deacon and Aeneas and others, and thanks to all of you who support us each month. Do continue. We are in a push. Peace out. God bless. Nakvam dis. Au revoir. Jusque la prochaine fois. Nawe. Um, adios. Todo, todo los, todos los pueblos. Wait, all of the villages? <laughs> My Spanish is not good. I want to thank you guys. Keep going, keep listening, keep supporting. First Things Foundation. Peace out.